evening, everybody. Can we give the band a hand? I know that they put a lot of dedication and work into this just to show some appreciation. Thanks, everybody. Um, so I'm thrilled to be here tonight. Uh, we've been walking through a series as a young adults group, so that's also college and young adults. So we have our young adults section right over here. If you're a young adult, there's a slight plug to get plugged in. Uh, but we've been walking through a series called Changes. Within the college season, there's a lot of different changes that are happening within your life. You're moving into a dorm, you're living with a roommate that's messy, that steals your clothes, that might even steal your food. There's a lot of different changes around this season of college. And so we wanted to address some of the spiritual changes that will happen in each and every person's life. And so, if you will, we're going to be in our week two study that we just passed through, which is about changes. So, uh, I'm going to open us up with a little bit of a cultural um, kind of quiz. I didn't know how it was pronounced. I was pronouncing it a, as a Met Gala, but it's Met Gala. So how many of you guys taking a poll know what I'm talking about when I say that? Okay, so most of us, okay, sweet. I didn't know what it was, so I had to look it up. Uh, this happened because my girlfriend and I, we were sending pictures of different people and how ridiculous they looked back and forth, like people in the name of fashion and celebrity like status were dressing as toasters. Um, so, right and wrong has kind of been redefined by a popular opinion, and so the definition of the Met Gala, for those of you who don't know exactly what this is, or the Met Gala, is the Met Ball is a fashion world equivalent of the Oscars. It's an evening when designers, models, and Hollywood stars convene in the year's most over-the-top looks to celebrate and fundraise at a new exhibit from the Metropolitan Museum, hence Meta, Met, and then uh, they dress up in costumes. So typically everyone dresses as a theme, and according to the feel or the kind of vibe of the exhibit, there's different themes. In the past they've had camp, religion, punk, and more. So I decided that I would show you some of the few costumes that I saw this past one and in the past that were some of the most ridiculous ones. So up first, uh, I think it's Katy Perry that we have. Um, this was one of the very first. This is her dressed in a chandelier. Um, this was like my response to that exact dress. For those of you who know, you know. If you know, you know. So then the next one, I think, is Kim Kardashian. Or no, sorry. This is Kobe Bryant's daughter, uh, Natalia. So she dressed kind of like a, I don't know, like a human disco ball. I don't know. It's just, what is that? I, I'm just not sure. The next one is Kim Kardashian. She's like, if you've ever played video games, this is like when you haven't unlocked that character yet, and then you're like waiting to see and still loading. So the next that we have on the list uh, is a little bit more of a political statement. You have people looking like it's, I don't know, Aquaman, the world, and then also a little bit of the LGBTQ community coming into play in the costume. This last one is also a statement of something that is political, and it's still up for debate on who wore it better. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly. So on a, on a funny level, you can relate to that, but on a more microscopic or an analytical view, we see this as, in the words of A.W. Tozer, a radical moral dislocation, a dislocation of what our values were according to fashion, celebrity status, and everything like that. Of course, it's over the top. It's a costume party. But this is the dislocation of values from society. One of the more, uh, I guess you could say, provocative dressed at the event was Megan Fox. And I don't encourage you to look it up. You don't have to. Trust me. Let me just t tell you, it was very provocative. She said on her Twitter, she said, in quotes, just me out here ignoring and defying all of your puritanical, emotionally repressed projections of what a woman should be. And keep in mind, if you don't know who Megan Fox is, she's the woman who starred in Transformers. She's been an icon to people throughout, like, I guess, this kind of, like, millennia that we find ourselves in. And according to, like, even studies, a lot of younger women can identify with Megan Fox because she's so relatable and so popular in the celebrity status. So this is kind of what our culture is reflecting right now, according to the 2021 Met Gala. So according to scripture and the teaching of midweek, let's stand in, in, in reverence for the reading of God's word so that we can get orientated to scripture. So we're going to be in John 15, and then we're going to kind of walk through a little bit of passages, so stay with me. So John 15, verse 18, it says, Just remember, when the unbelieving world hates you, they first hated me. 
If you were to give your allegiance to the world, of course they would love and welcome you as one of their own, but because you won't align yourself with the values of this world, they will hate you. I have chosen you and taken you out of this world to be mine, so remember what I taught you, that as a servant, you're not superior to your master. And since they have persecuted me, don't worry, they're also going to persecute, persecute you. And if they obey my teachings, they will obey yours. They will treat you this way because you are mine and they don't know the one who sent me. Continuing in John chapter 17, this is Jesus' prayer to his disciples, which is a great moment seeing into what his words for his disciples were. He says in verse 6, I have revealed you to the ones you have uh, gave me from this world, according to Jesus talking to God. They were always yours. You gave them to me, and they kept your word. They adhered to it. Now they know that everything I have is a gift from you, that I have passed on to them the message you gave me. They have accepted it, and they know it came from you, and they believe you sent me. Verse 9, my prayer is not for the world, but for those who have given me, because they belong to you. All who are mine belong to you, and you have given them to me. So bring me glory. Now I am departing from this world. They are staying in this world, but I am coming to you. Jesus is coming to Jesus, or Jesus is coming to God at this point. Verse 13, now I am coming to you. I told them many things while I was with them in the world, in this world, so they would be filled with joy. I have given them your word. The, word, the world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong in this world any more than I do. Make them holy. And then skipping down to verse 18, it says, Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. Let's pray. Lord, we just come before you and we bow our heads in reverence of your scripture, what you prayed over your disciples. As Lord, we adhere to Scripture, we memorize Scripture, and we walk it out daily so that we, we can have the blessed life, following according to the principles of Scripture, but also to the truth of Scripture and what leads to the good life and the fruitful life. And so, Lord, I pray that as we dive into Scripture and we examine the culture around us, Lord, I pray that you would highlight the areas in our heart, highlight the ways that we've fallen astray to the, to the devious ways that the world works and align ourselves back with Scripture. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can be seated. So what does John, Jesus, and the writers of the New Testament have all in common when they say the world? What do they mean? So a little bit of a, a historical lesson. So this is the Greek word. This is what the world is translated to. This is where we get our word cosmos. So I want you to think of the word ball. When, I, when you think of the word ball, you have like a practice, like tennis ball, baseball, basketball, football, any type of ball that you can throw, a physical object. You can also attend a ball, such as a dance. You can have also a ball at the ball. So you can have a great time at said dance. So when you think of the word world or cosmos, think of the word ball with many meanings. So there's three types of meanings when we look at the word the world in these passages. The first is planet Earth, the second is humanity, and the third is culture. When we refer, refer to planet Earth, this is like in Romans 1 verse 20, it says, For ever since the world was created, people have seen the sky and the earth. Again, the world was created, so planet Earth. The next is humanity, as in John 3 16, so for this is how God loved the world humanity in its whole and its entirety. And then the third is in culture and what we just read. Some different theologians have titled this word or this phrase, the world, in different ways. Looking at the first theologian, he said, a culture, the pattern of beliefs, social forms, dispositions, and values that are institutionalized in a people's collective life. Dallas Willard says our cultural and social practices, the things that go on in our normal day-to-day, -day, that are under the control of Satan and thus opposed to God. And finally, the systems of practices and standards associated with secular society. So I want you, if you're taking notes, to kind of hold on to that word secular society. And as we look at somebody else, um, quoting from Patrick Dean, he said in one of his books, he said, in this world... Gratitude to the past and obligations to the future are replaced by nearly universal pursuits of immediate gratification. Think of like Hot Pockets or like anything microwavable, immediate gratification. 
culture rather than imparting the wisdom and experience of past generations of past people like i think of like your grandmother's recipe that has been passed down passed down passed down like that stuff is gold like now you can just look up something in a world of knowledge and technology you would think that culture rather than imparting the wisdom and experience of the past so as to cultivate virtues of self-restraint and civility becomes synonymous with the hedonic hedonic titillation or think of megan fox Um, The visceral crudeness and distractions, all of this orientated towards promoting consumption, appetite, and detachment. As a result, superficially superficially self-maximizing, self or socially destructive behaviors began to dominate the society. So what much of what the world calls culture or what your friends might call culture is what scripture would call the world. And what we look at in Scripture, it says to stray away from that, to run away from this culture, because it will pervert you into thinking that something is good when ultimately it's dislocated from morals. So the word the world is what happens when sin spreads through a society and starts to warp the idea of shalom, and the idea of shalom being warped is now normalized. So there's kind of two different sins or temptations all throughout Scripture. The first is uh, rebellion. This is like the first thing that you'll see within Scripture, Adam and Eve rebelling against God and his commands, right? This is also something that you can trace back into each different character in the Bible. So the first one is rebellion, and the second is the redefinition of what is good and evil. So rebellion is to seize autonomy, to kind of separate yourself from God, or just do things on your own, or in the language of here and now, to become secularized. And then, of course, the rebellion or the redefinition is to redefine what is good on your terms rather than what is good on principles. Think back to the costumes and how ridiculous they look. So, Yuval Noah, who wrote a book, said, Earlier times, it was God who could define goodness. He could define righteousness and beauty. But today, those answers lie within us. Our feelings give meaning to our private lives but also our social and political processes. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. The customer is always right. The voter knows best. And if it feels good, then just do it and think for yourself. These are some of the main humanist credos of today. These are the main humanist credos of today. And especially if you deal with like young adults or if you have kids, you understand like they are consuming so much content, so much information that they can be led astray that quick. Like, by the scrolling of TikTok, somebody can be planting seeds of this world or the secular thought or the culture in just this innocent sense into your heart and you begin to follow after the ways of the world. So, kind of like a little bit of a paradigm, what was universally condemned in the past is now celebrated. What was universally celebrated is now condemned. And then those who refuse to celebrate are now condemned. And this is all in the name of progress, which can be good at some points in time. If you think about slavery slavery or even racism, if you think back to what was universally celebrated is now condemned, this is good. That is where the gospel comes in and it reconciles what has been wronged. But in the words of divorce or greed, or even in the LGBTQ community, love or love is love begins to be perverted in a different sense. This is what the writer of the New Testament, Paul, called the wisdom of the world. And God was to make foolish the wisdom of the world. So I want to read uh, from C.S. Lewis. I was telling our young adults that anytime you have a sermon, it's like, it's like requirement to like quote from C.S. Lewis or at least read a little bit of C.S. Lewis in any like form. So I want to read from you uh, screw tape letters. This is an excerpt from the, his book that was published in 1942. It says, since the enemy's servants have been preaching about the world as one of the great standards of temptation for 2,000 years, this might seem difficult to do. So in context, this is one demon talking to a younger demon, mentoring in him how to lead astray believers or people of faith. He says, this might be difficult to do, but fortunately they have said very little about it for the last few decades. In modern Christian, or modern Christian writings, 
Though I see much indeed more than I like about mammon, and mammon is the god of, of wealth or greed or monetary possessions. Though I, see, um, though I see much and more, indeed more than I like about mammon, I see few of the old warnings about worldly vanities, the choice of friends, and the value of time. All that your patient would probably classify as Puritanism, and may I remark in the passing, in passing that the value we have given to the world, in the demonic sense, is one of the really solid triumphs of the last hundred years. By it, we rescue annually, annually thousands of humans from temperance or self-restraint, chastity, and the sobriety of life. 1942. Little has been said in the church about this temptation to the world. There's been a lot said about, you know, the prosperity gospel or even that, you know, if you, if you follow after the ways of the world and the monetary gains, like you will be distracted and ultimately you're not going to be serving God. A lot has been said about that. But what has been said about the temptation of the world, the temptation to adhere to the culture and what is popular around us? The temptation is greater now than it's ever been. I just think of um, the, the opportunity to, to invest in a different relationship because we, as we have diversified ethnically, we've also diversified ethically. So Philip Reef, who kind of did some study over this, and this is kind of a little bit of sociology for you guys. So he did some studies over the paradigm shift within the culture of the West. And he said, we've moved from one, one phase to the second stage to now the third stage. So these three stages are defined as the pre-Christian culture, which is the Rome or the Celtic Britain or Africa before the gospel. This is where they believed in gods, goddesses, like the spiritual side of things. They were even superstitious to a certain degree. Then in the second uh, kind of period, which is the Christian culture or Christianized, because you can't have a Christian culture it just doesn't go hand in hand. It kind of grammatically doesn't work. So think of Christianized culture. This is when people groups begin to be reconciled because the gospel comes into that place, into that people group, into that ethnic group. And it's a mix of pagan ideas as well as Christian ideas. This is, the great, this is great Britain or Britain in the 19th century. And then contrary to popular belief, this is actually America at the second great awakening to about the 1950s. So now we've entered into the post-Christian culture, which is not the same as a pre-Christian culture. So you don't just go back into the pre-Christian. This isn't like a cycle. I wish it was that you just kind of go back. Hopefully it's not at the same time because then that would mean that people are worshiping like Greek gods, also sacrificing their firstborn children. All that would be pretty bad. But think of this as like pre-teens rebelling against their parents. Like we've all experienced it. We might have been guilty of it. But preteens rebel against their parents even though they're eating their food and sleeping under their house. This is what's happening here and now. Mark Sayers, who was uh, a person who studied over this and wrote a, a book called The Disappearing Church, he said, post Christianity is not pre Christianity. Rather, post Christianity attempts to move beyond Christianity while simultaneously feeding upon its fruit. Post Christian culture attempts to retain a, the solace of faith or the feeling of faith whilst gutting it of its costs, commitments, and restraints that the gospel places upon the individual will, kind of like the idea of submitting your will to God's will. Post-Christianity intuitively, intuitively yearns for the justice and shalom of the kingdom whilst defending the reign of the individual will. I mean, just look back at what happened in 2020. Everything chaotic, everything melting down, everything just all over the place. Wanting the justice, yearning for the shalom of the kingdom, while also defending the reign of the individual will. He talked about how from this pipeline of the kingdom, of, of the fruit of the kingdom, it stems from the roots of Jesus. Things like equality, things like human rights, decency, generosity, all of these things are rooted inside of Jesus and come from the kingdom of God. And ultimately what he said is that these people in the 21st century, in the modern digital urban age that we find ourselves in, we want the kingdom without the king. We want the fruits without the labor. Cue all of the ideas of spirituality, 
the ideas of, um, you know, you can manifest things if you say it so many times in the mirror, cue like tarot cards, cue all of the things that are popular here and now within the youth. So the great danger to our day and age is this emergence of this DIY faith within the church. This mix of pagan ideas, this mix of, of, of Jesus' way, identity politics, consumerism even, radical individualism, progressive thought and ethics, ethics, all mixed together to produce a faith, but again, not submitted to God's will or even to a biblical sense. David Tackle in his book, The Truth About Lies, says, an alarming number of Christians are very prone to viewing their faith as largely a volunteer enterprise. They pick and choose which values they wish to adopt from Scripture and which they will adopt from the dominant culture. This systemic approach of faith is only possible because of the unexamined assumptions that we are in charge of our doctrine, dogma, and morals rather than God. Much of it appeals or much of its appeal lies in the ability to blend in with the surrounding culture, minimize our discomfort, and still hold on to the illusion of being Christian-like in one's behavior. So on a, like a, a little bit easier note, um, something that we, my, my girlfriend and I kind of do is we ask each other if we should have dessert. So, you know, there'll be like a piece of pie that was at home the other day, and she asked me, she's like, should we have a piece of pie? And I was like... Uh, no, I don't think so. And then we ended up having two because I said yes. And then I said yes again because it was so good. But this is where we get to ask if it's fine to do something, right? We say, hey, should we do this? And really it's meaning like, can I get away with this and not be judged? And will you participate in it with me so that way I cannot be judged at all? And it's like, yes, right? Of course, who can say no to pie? But this is the human condition that plays into this self-validating feedback loop. The devil's trick and primary stratagem to drive the human soul, to divide the church, to drive us into ruin is deceptive ideas that plant disordered desires or even dislocated desires that are normalized in a sinful society. Just think about Megan Fox's quote. So what we have to ask ourselves, as a community, as a church, as people who reside in Lubbock, furthering the gospel in a culture where the world or culture is progressing 10 times faster, in what ways has culture influenced us? How much culture is in me that I'm bringing into relationships within the church? Scripture talks about how the, the, the pleasure of sin is like passing. It's like dust in your mouth that just leaves you with bitterness. If you chase after the world, ultimately it will take more than it gives and it will leave you with less than you had. I think of the old saying that sin isn't bad because it's forbidden. It's forbidden because it's bad. It doesn't lead to the, the fruitful life or anything at all. It leads to death as in the language of Scripture. So we can't trust the majority of our feelings or the majority of people around us. We have to trust in Jesus and his word and the mental maps that he provides for us or in the language of scripture, trusting in lady wisdom. So it's easy for us to kind of like examine everybody else, examine our friends, examine all the people out in the world and then look at them and be like, you know, they got it all wrong. Like, I think of all the people that post on social media that rant about one political side or another, and they are dead set that they have it right, but this side is dead set that they have it right, right? Just think of back to 2020, the, the tension between people groups because of color, because they have it right, because they've defined it, because it's a DIY faith, and what I value, what my experiences are, is what defines my faith, not scripture, because when's the last time we were invested and invested deeply into scripture? Like nobody kind of like wakes up and like is like, man, I'm super ready to read three chapters of the Bible. Like if you are, teach me your ways because like I'm like dying to know how to read more scripture. But I don't just wake up with this urge to dive into scripture and like Mickey, like read these like theologians and these like Mark Grudems and like all these crazy guys of the faith, right? We don't just do that on a leisure Sunday afternoon with sipping some tea or coffee. We find ourselves distracted. We find ourselves hurried. We find ourselves 
walking from place to place, not with the thought of God in our mind, but the thought of what our day and our schedule is supposed to be like, and how what's missing, and this person didn't show up, and that person never responded to me, and I'm hurt, and all this trauma is just noise keeping me from relationship with God. Because again, culture is a culture of busyness. But again, if we look at God in Scripture and the way that He created the earth, if we look at nature, it's not a rushed place. It's not a hurried place. But yet everything that is intended gets done. So again, how can we orientate our life or re, like, join back the dislocated parts of our body to function in the proper way inside of a community pushing the gospel forward? I want to read 1 John 2, 15 through 16. Again, it says, Don't set the affections of your heart on this world. This is Jesus. Or in loving the things of the world. The love of the Father, the love of the Father and the love of the world are incompatible. For all that the world can offer us, the gratification of our flesh, the allurement of the things of the world, and the obsession with status and importance. None of these things come from the Father, but from the world, or I would argue from culture. This world and the desires are in the process of passing away, but those who love to do the will of God will live forever. Amen. That is good news for us. Again, we are so easily distracted. We are so easy to repeat, and we're, we're not as quick to learn. But if we can learn to invest in reading in Scripture, to memorize Scripture, so that way when the culture comes and there's things like the Met Gala and these people are dressing crazy and Megan Fox is tweeting this and these celebrities are saying this, we can align ourselves back to Scripture and say this is what leads to the, like, the fruitful life. This stuff doesn't lead to the fruitful life. This leads to the fruitful life. This bears witness with the angels in heaven echoing the beauty of creation. I don't have to redefine beauty. I don't have to redefine what it means to be a human. I can look at scripture and examine it and trust that it is good and that it will lead me to the prosperous life. As we kind of close, I want to put up two comparisons. So in reference to the world, I want to also put up Eve's temptation. And I'm going to read the fall or Genesis 2 and kind of verses 3 through 7. So as we read this, as I read this, I want you to look up on the screen and examine the two. So the world and what First John is talking about, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eye, the pride of life, could it be that this is Eve's temptation and it's just a repetition of it? Because this is what we struggle with even in the 21st century. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, you may eat from the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And then pay attention to verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and desirable for gaining wisdom, she took of it and ate. Then, in verse 7, the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. You see, our enemy isn't the politician that doesn't believe the same as us. It's not our neighbor that, that has a really weird house that has melons growing out of it. It's not the person at work that always is trying to get you mad and tear you apart. It's not your siblings that you had an argument on the way here with. You see, our enemy is the devil the flesh, and the world. The world and the culture around us. And if we're not careful, we're susceptible to that culture very easily. So as my hope and my prayer as a community is that we gather and we gather with the intention to understand scripture and then go out and read more scripture so that we orientate our life 
back to principles, back to the principles of fashion in the words of costumes. But again, I leave you with the question, how much culture is in you? And contrast that with, with how much scripture is in you. I want to ask that for everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes. Maybe you're like, Jonathan, I don't, I don't even know how much scripture I know. I haven't even read the Bible once. <laughs> I don't even know how to read. <laughs> the list goes on. I don't have time for it. But my friend, there's an opportunity to deepen your relationship with Christ here and now. You don't have to read all the Bible. You don't have to know all the disciples' names. You don't have to step into this idea of understanding theology and doctrine and dogma before you enter into a relationship with Jesus. You can submit your life, your individual will, to His will and be directed into the the, the life that bears fruit in the language of Scripture. So I'm going to lead us in a prayer, and I want everybody to pray this as an act of encouragement and championing to those who might be praying this for the very first time or even to rededicate their life after hearing this message tonight. Repeat after me. Dear God in heaven, I know that I am a sinner. I know that I'm in need of a Savior. There's only one Savior, and His name is Jesus. I call upon you, Jesus. I ask you now, come into my heart, come into my life, come into my schedule, be my Lord and be my Savior. I turn from sin and I turn to the true and living God. I receive your love, your grace, and your forgiveness. Dear God in heaven, you're now my Father and I am your child. Give me strength to live for you and serve you all the days of my life, beginning today for the rest of eternity. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.